hi. Welcome back. Um, we've been doing a series on women in the Bible, and I'm so enchanted, encouraged by some of them, the incredible women, women of great report, great, great um, ability to punt in a situation. You know, uh, we always think, well, we want our life to go this way, this way, this way. And fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to look at it, we're not always in control of our lives and what happens and the way things are going to go down and that kind of thing. So I wanted to, to take you today to my favorite biblical character, and her name is Leah. And I just, I'm amazed at her. So the background on the story is, and we talked about this on the teaching about Rebecca, is uh, we know we have Rebecca's twins, Jacob and Esau, and Rebecca uh, stood in the, the forefront and argued for Jacob in many ways and positioned him in order to get the blessing. And when, he, when she did that, she also put him in danger because Esau was so angry and so jealous that he, he promised to kill Jacob as soon as their dad died. And so in, in order to save Jacob's life, Rebecca asked Isaac to give Jacob permission to go to Haran and get a wife. And so this is where we enter the story. So when Jacob leaves the compound at Beersheba or near Beersheba, he's what I would call a wimp. You know, hey, he's been sitting around the tent. He's mama's boy. He knows a lot. He know, he's very, very intelligent. He knows a lot. But he doesn't have a lot of practical knowledge. He was not a huntsman, a hunter like his brother. He didn't know how to survive out there in the great open spaces because he'd always been around the family and cooking and cleaning and doing the things and um, just being a part of the homestead instead of out there in the wild spot where Esau was a wild guy. <clears throat> so now, <clears throat> excuse me, Jacob flees for his life. He's afraid. He's afraid for his brother. He is so afraid that he leaves with nothing and he just heads out because he needs to cover as much ground as possible and he travels alone. Normally someone of his stature would have an entourage, but he didn't. He had just himself, his staff, and God. Staff being the pole, not personnel. And so he flees. And the first time we see anything about this journey is when he is in, um, on the way and he runs into God. And if we look at chapter uh, Genesis 28, chapter, uh, chapter 28, verse 10, it says, Then they, Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and spent the night there, because the sun had set, and he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head or at his head and laid down in that place. And he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set on the earth, which is with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and then descending. Now, the reason I'm pointing out that to you is because that is indicative of our prayers. Our prayers have to go up to heaven before they can come back down. Now, according to Jewish theology, this is the changing of the guard. When, when Jacob set out, he had one group of angels walking with him. And as he was going to cross over, they changed the guard and another group of angels came down. Those went up, the others came down. So he's leaving, he's headed to Haran, he has this dream. In verse, in verse 13, chapter 28, and he says, I, the dream says, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Get that? To the descendants of Jacob, not Esau, Jacob. And your descendants shall also be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread out to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you, and in your descendants, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. 
for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. This is God in the dream to Jacob. Jacob wakes up. He is just, oh, wow. I'm sure he's questioning, was that God? Was that really God? Oh, my goodness. And but he says, he's the God of your father and the God of Abraham. So he's not Jacob's God yet. He knows about God. He knows about this God, but he's not had that personal encounter with him yet. But it's coming, I promise you. So what does he do? He takes the stone that he laid on. In fact, according to Judaism, it wasn't just one stone. It was he had taken a number of stones and he'd make like a U shape around his where he's going to lay down with these stones. He did this with him. And that was to protect him from the night crawlers and things. And then he had one stone that he used as a pillow. I mean, I thought the pillow I had last night in the hotel was pretty hard. This was hard. Anyhow, so he uses, so he takes these stones and he builds an altar. And then he says, he makes a promise back to God. Now remember, we think that, that Isaac is about to die. And verse 20 says, Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. And the stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and all of that thou dost give me, I will surely give a tenth to thee. So he took the stone, according to Jewish tradition, the multitude of stones he had shaped around himself and the big stone that he had laid on his pillow all merged into one, a larger stone. He anointed it with oil, and then he prayed the prayer. Okay, then. And so then he takes off. I'm sure he was feeling a little more confident now than he had when he laid down his head the night before because the dream hadn't happened. But now he's had this reassurance that God is with him and that this journey is of God. So he's going off to Haran. Now, it takes a few days to get there. I mean, this is a long journey. Really, it's a long journey. He has to go over, if you know the terrain, probably the simplest and best way to go is over like the fall of Jordan River, go up the Jordan River, go around, come over up north of Turkey. And this is where he's going. So it's a long journey. He's on foot. He doesn't have any money, so he can't buy an animal to ride. And he's just on foot. And so now he is becoming from this wimpy guy that was hanging around the house all the time. He becomes a man, a macho man. How do I know that? There's a clue. You know, the Bible is full of clues if we will just read them with discernment and look at them. And so we see the clue here in chapter 29. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the sons of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field. And behold, three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it. For from that well they watered the flocks. Now the stone on the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, then they would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place on the mouth of the well. And Jacob said to them, My brothers, where are you from? And they said, We're from Haran. He said, Ah, praise God. I've made it to Haran. Yay, sing a song. And so he says to them, well, okay, do you know, um, do you know Laban? He said, yeah, we know Laban. In fact, that's his daughter right now coming with the sheep. Jacob is just thrilled. He's made it. He survived. He went from that wimpy young man to like, whoa, look at this guy. Pretty nice. And overcomes this beautiful shepherdess with her sheep. And so he said to, this, to the sheep, to the shepherds there, said, so why don't you water your sheep and get on down the road? And it's like, it's not even time to be sitting here for watering. And they said, well, we all have to wait till everybody comes. And then we work together to lift this heavy stone. And he says, okay. So now he looks over, he sees Rachel coming and he is adrenaline flowing. And so, and they said to him, that's Laban's daughter right there. And so what does Jacob do? He runs, he hugs her, he kisses her, not that, on the lips, but kisses her in the Middle Eastern way, chick, chick. 
she's startled. She has no idea what's going on. She's not aware of who this guy is. And all of a sudden, he's just appearing there. And what is she supposed to do with him? And then he walks over, single-handedly, removes the stone from the well. And they water the sheep. Now, she's standing there saying, Whoa, Superman has arrived. Minus the cape. Although, she is so impressed with him. He's a good-looking guy. Maybe he's a little dirty because he's walked so far. His clothes may be a little weary, but maybe not because he asked God for provision for that as well. But she is impressed with this guy. And then he tells her who he is and that he has come. He wants to meet Laban. And so she runs home. Daddy, 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 daddy. Daddy comes out. It's Abba. Daddy comes out and she, she tells him the whole story. She's so excited. She can hardly talk. She tells him the whole story. And what does he do? He runs down the mountainside to the watering system. And he sees, sees Jacob. His nephew has arrived. Bring out the fatty calf. The kid has to come home. And he's not a kid. He's macho. And so they go into his encampment, to Laban's encampment. And they have a feast. And Laban tells him the story. And he says, yes, my father did get, get your, did marry your sister, Rebecca, and there was great wealth. However, I fled the encampment so fast that I have no wealth to offer a bride. And so Laban says, well, okay, stay with us. Stay with us for 30 days, free gratis. Just stay. Rest. Contemplate think about things. Well, in that 30 days time frame, all kinds of things happened. And he fell in love with Rachel. Absolutely fell in love with Rachel, the shepherdess whom he had helped water her sheep. And so he tells Laban, I'm, I want to stay with you, but I can stay for nothing. And so Laban says, okay, so you can work with us, you can earn your keep. And he says, tell you what, I want to marry Rachel. However, I have nothing to offer her, nothing to give you for the bride price. So I'll work for seven years for her. Well, really? Seven years? I mean, that's a long time. Seven years. Think about it. You could have your doctorate degree in seven years if you push for it. Seven years is a long time. So they make the agreement. Now, there's one thing. Rachel and, and Jacob have to stay apart. They can never be alone together. They have to be chaperoned. She has to be away from him, even though she's just dying to get her hands on him and he likewise on her. And she's the younger of two sisters, Rachel, Leah. So on goes the time. Seven years goes by so fast. Now, to me, it would seem like an eternity. But to him, because he's so madly in love with her and he can't wait and he works hard and he helps, he helps Laban around the farm, around the, the pastures and everything. And he, he figures out things. Now, he doesn't really know that much about shepherding because he had not been shepherding. Remember, he had been hanging out around the encampment. But now he's heard enough stories around the, the shepherd fires that he can figure out things. He figures out better better ways to maintain the sheep. He figures out better ways to feed the sheep. He figures out better grazing things. I mean, the guy is working. He's really working to help his father-in-law. And all the time on the back of his mind is, I'm going to get Rachel. I'm going to get Rachel. So the wedding day comes. He's put in his seven years and he goes to Laban and he says, seven years are up. She's mine. Give her, give her, give her. And, and Laban says, okay, all right, we'll do that. But we're going to have a celebration. And we'll have a celebration tonight. All the brothers will come in. And we'll have this huge campfire event. And then you can take your bride. And so they do that. Party, party, party. And what happens? There's a whole lot of drinking that goes on. And they get him drunk. Really, really drunk. And then they take him to the wedding tent. 
And then in comes the bride. Now remember how Rebecca covered her face with her veil when she saw her groom? When she saw uh, Isaac in the field, she veiled her face. So here comes the bride. She comes into the tent. It's dark. Jacob is drunk. Maybe he's not drunk out of his gourd, but he's drunk. And he sees the bride come in. She's beautiful. She's veiled as a bride should be. And he comes in and he looks at her and he's so excited. And they make mad, passionate, wonderful love all through the night. And it's great. It's absolutely great. And he is so happy and he's just mastering his life. And then morning comes. And when morning comes and he's talking sweet talk to her, she's lying there face down on the, on the wedding couch, which is, you know, blankets on the floor. He's talking sweet nothings to her, twiddling with her hair, and gently waking her up. And she turns over and he says, ah, You're not Rachel. You're Leah. What on earth is going on here? You're not my bride. And he's furious. He's shocked. He's furious. Out that opening he goes and he finds Laban. No, Laban's sitting over here poking into the ashes waiting. He knows what's coming. The angry son-in-law is coming. The angry nephew son-in-law is coming. And Laban knows he's got to deal with this. So, Jacob just raises Cain with him and says, What do you think you're doing? You gave me the wrong woman, and you know you did. And Laban says, Yeah, it's not such a big deal. You know, here in our part of the country, our part of the world, it is not appropriate for the younger to marry before the older. So, you got Leah. Did she make you happy? And Jacob said, yes, she made me happy, but that's not the point. The point is, I worked for seven years for Rachel. I didn't want Leah. I'm not in love with Leah. I want Rachel. Huh. Laban says, really now? Okay. These are your options. You can work for another seven years for Rachel. Or we can kick you out of the camp right now. But before you can have Rachel, you got to finish the bride week with Leah. Stay in the tent with her. Be there with her all week. Do your duty as a man. After the bride week, you can have Rachel. But you have to work the next seven years to pay for her. Can you imagine the anger, the bitterness, the resentment? You're caught. If you want the one you love, then you have to sleep for a week with the one you don't love. Not a happy story. Not a happy thought. So he goes trumping back into that tent. Can't you just see him pulling the opening over? Poor Leah is devastated. She's the victim here. She doesn't know what's going on. Her dad told her that Rachel had agreed to this because this is the custom. The older marries before the younger. And Laban said, I really thought in that seven year time frame somebody would come along and ask for Leah's hand. Didn't happen. So deal with it. I mean, we don't deal with things like that very well, do we? We just don't. So what we have happening here then is Jacob goes back into the tent and he spends that bridal week with Leah. They come to a peaceful understanding. She comes to an understanding that she's the victim here. Rachel's a victim. Although her father's told her that Rachel has agreed to this, she still knows everything's wrong. And will it ever be right? Will there ever be a clear understanding in this marriage? It's a triangle. It's an absolute triangle.
So what happens next? Now, I'll give you a little commercial here. I know you're just going to love this. But you know what? I've written a story about this. It's called Genesis Triangle. It's about the whole story. So I'm going to finish telling you the story, but you might want to get the book because it's pretty good. And I can say that, even though I wrote it, I can say that because I really do believe God dictated it to me. So I'm bragging on God. All right, so now we have the marriage week is over with. He gets Rachel. Rachel's a mess. She's just a mess. She's, uh, she feels like she's been beat upon by everybody that she ever trusted, her father, her sister, the man she loves. Nobody's cared for Rachel. Poor Rachel. So, verse uh, chapter 29, verse 28. And Jacob did so and completed her week, and he gave him his daughter Rachel as his wife. Laban also gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her maid. So Jacob went in to Rachel also, and indeed he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served Laban for another seven years. Now the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, and he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Okay, now we have a civil war going on in the encampment. However, it's not all that civil, because Leah, the unloved one, is suddenly the one who could bear children. Rachel, the one who's so loved, can't bear children. And so what we have here is a conflict on every level. And jealousy begins to take over in the encampment. And so as we go on with the story now, we're going to, but what you're going to see is the unfolding of these women's personalities. And you will see in Judaism, a name means something. You know, our names mean something too, but we don't put the emphasis on it that they did at this time. So in Judaism, when you name a child, there's a reason for it. So in verse uh, 32, And Leah conceived and bore a son and named him Reuben. For she said, Because the Lord has seen my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. Surely he'll love me now. Because I'm pregnant. I'm going to give him a child. I'm going to give him an heir. Isn't that what every man wants? It's an heir an heir to his kingdom, someone to inherit from him. That's what she thought. So God has seen me, so she named him Reuben. And then, in verse 33, Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. So she named him Simeon, Hebrew Shimon, Simeon. God has heard. God has seen my anguish. God has heard my cry. He has given me another son. Surely now, surely now, my husband will love me. Well, it didn't work. And so then she gets pregnant and she has a third son. And she names him Levi, meaning join. Surely now, God will join us together, my husband and me. Surely now. There'll be a reconciliation between us. There'll be a unity and a oneness in spirit. There'll be this coming together as husband and wife, and he'll love me as much as he does my sister. Now, you might be wondering, what well, here, well, if he loves Rachel so much, and he's basically living with Rachel full time, then how come it's Leah that gets pregnant all the time by Jacob? Well, you see, in Judaism, when a woman's having her period, a man is not allowed to go near her. So I am quite convinced that when Rachel is having her period, Jacob goes over to Leah's tent and fellowships with her in a marital way. And so then she gets pregnant with the fourth son. Now this time, I mean, this woman has done everything she can think of to get this man to love her. And so she has this fourth son whose name, whom she named Judah. And Judah means praise. And at this point she says, Okay, I surrender. I've done everything I know to do. He still does not love me. He loves my sister. So I am just going to praise the Lord. Praise Him, worship Him, love Him. Because in my despair, 
I have nowhere to turn but to God the Father. And so she does this. Now remember, she's Laban's daughter. They are not necessarily godly people. They have idols. Laban is an idol worshiper. You know, there's Tara's grandson. He's an idol worshiper. She's been raised to worship idols. But all of a sudden, she gets this God thing. Apparently, Jacob's told her a lot in that week that they were together, or maybe in the ensuing weeks afterwards, because now she's had the fourth son, whom she names Judah, and she's saying, I am going to praise God. Nuts to all of this stuff. I'm not going to fight for him anymore. I'm not going to worry about him. I'm just going to praise God. And that's what she does. And we see that. There's clues. As I've told you before, God gives us clues to everything if we'll just dig it out, dig it out, dig it out. The clues are there. And so we see what happens now because uh, of what she names her next son. What? Her next son? Yes, she has a son. But before she has another son, we see the sons of Jacob coming through Rachel. But Rachel's not pregnant. In fact, she's threatening Jacob. You get me pregnant or I'm going to die. Well, I think that converts to, hey, you don't get me pregnant? I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to off myself. It's a major tantrum. She's throwing a tantrum. You get me pregnant or I'm going to die. I'll kill myself. And he says, really? You expect me to do something that God can't do? If you were going to get pregnant, God would have already opened your womb. So what is your issue? I can't do this. Only God can do it. And she stomps off and says, forget your God. I have my own gods. I mean, that's Bible according to Margie. But that's what I think she did. Now we have to finish next week.